Sounds good. Okay. And have a, have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to thank you for joining me this morning. We're going to be talking about yin yang theory, the five elements in your health. Uh, so it's going to be a fun hour that I'm uh, looking forward to sharing with you. And before we get going, um, it's important for me to say that this really is just for your information only. This isn't medical advice. I may be a healthcare practitioner, but you need to work with your own doctor if you have very specific questions related to anything that you learn here, um, as well as uh, any questions that, um, that you may have specific to your health. Uh, if you have any questions just on the course content um, and you'd like some more information, feel free to email me. I believe Nikki has the information, but um, I'm gonna say it right here, it's Sarika at naturallylivingtoday.com. That's my email address. And I'm usually quite good about getting back to people. So, um, so yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it. So this is um, information that first I wanna preface uh, my training in traditional Chinese medicine. It's something that um, I actually, um, that was four plus years of year round study. And so we're going to be embarking on something that um, I, I just want you to, to know that if it seems like it might be a little bit challenging to really grasp this, it's because it is a very involved theory. But I want to make it fun today. I want to make it about how you can maybe see yourself or your loved ones in this information. So um, let's go ahead and get started. So the five elements, you know, why do we talk about the five elements? What's this all about? And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I uh, really, really love is um, that this, this uh, quote here from a modern day practitioner, his name is Nan Lu, and it says, everything that appears in the physical realm is always connected with energy flow at the invisible level. And I just absolutely love this quote. I just think this is uh, really beautiful. Um, I think that in Western society and culture, we uh, get into the habit of not recognizing our place within the flow of things. And that there's actually usually quite an energetic flow that um, goes beyond our five senses and our ability to see and touch and feel that sort of thing. And quite honestly, that is so much of what the theory of uh, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture is based upon, is this energetic flow. And so uh, what, what the five elements help us to do is to see ourselves reflected in the environment that we live in, and in turn to see the environment that we live in reflected in who we are. And so um, it's, a neat, it's a neat pursuit. The five element theory comes from Taoist thought. So T-A-O, Tao, as in, you may have heard the Tao Pu. And it's kind of, when you pronounce it, it's kind of a, it's between a T and a D <laughs> that you say at the same time. So, uh, but it, it arises from this ancient, ancient philosophical practice. Um, and uh, so it is also in keeping with this Chinese medicine theory. It's a system of thought that is many thousands of years old. And uh, again, this allows us to see the essence of the human body really from a different paradigm than what we uh, are accustomed to in the Western culture. Um, I know that when I first started studying the theory of Chinese medicine, when I went to school for that, and I sat in my first class of theory, I felt like what had happened with that was that I had been given back a language that I didn't know had gone missing. And I realize now after all these years of practice was what that was is it was just common sense. If someone was speaking common sense to me. And in the practice of Chinese medicine, um, again, what we're working with is, is how we would you know, maybe tend a garden or take care of our yard, something like that, where you know, if there's something really wet, we need to dry it out. If something's cold, we need to warm it up. And there's such a simplicity to this framework. And at the same time, it's tremendously profound. And so I'm excited to share a little bit of this with you. Um, and because what this does is this does, it allows us to see the essence of the human body. And this goes into our appearance, the things we can do, the things we have challenge with. And that includes our emotions, our mental affect, as well as our desires, you know, the things that we don't like. 
it just goes into everything. It's all interrelated. And there's something so beautiful and sublime about that. And this is, in the five element theory, it's a reflection of five different states of worldly phenomena, matter. Uh, so that would be wind, wood, fire, earth, and water. And um, it's, uh, it, and I have to say, what you'll see often in um, a lot of uh, um, information around five element theory is wind will uh, take the place of metal. And so what I wrote here was wind, and that is certainly one, one interpretation that you'll see of that. But in, in true Chinese medicine, uh, what we talk about is actually metal. And so um, I don't want there to be a whole lot of confusion about that, but you'll see that sometimes when you're reading about five element theory. And so the functionality of this five element model that we're talking about here, what it does is it allows us to organize and group information about a given person into a workable whole. Um, and when we're armed with that kind of information, we're able to enhance what needs support or what needs reduction in that person. Um, and so, you know, because sometimes people People can be excess in given presentations. Uh, you know, they can be too excitable or they can have a lot of phlegm that they're generating when they have a really bad cold. So sometimes we need to reduce aspects of a person while at the same time bringing other aspects of that person up. I mean, think about it. Sometimes when you've had a really bad cold and you feel like you're not able to kind of get your, um, your energy back after that cold or a bad flu, uh, we would say, you know, it's going to be very important to work on another element where we're helping to build that person up at their root. And so these are things that um, they all, there's always this interrelationship that's going on. And so this really is a fun way for you to consider your own constitution, you know, as seen through this five element um, prism. So um, let's go ahead, before we get into uh, kind of talking about some of these components, uh, one of the other things that we need to discuss is yin-yang theory. And I'm sure all of us have seen this symbol right here, the yin-yang symbol. And, um, but I know for myself, I didn't understand the implications of what this, what this means. And so when we look at this symbol right here, um, it is, we see that it is an encompassing whole, that there is this big outer circle that is encompassing the light and the dark. So we see that. But as we see, even in the light, there's a speck of the dark. And even in the dark, there's a speck of the light. And so what this shares with us from a theoretical standpoint is that nothing is ever something entirely. There's always a little bit of a counterbalance to whatever that is. And in yin-yang theory, <clears throat> when we talk about yin, what we're talking about is the darker, uh, more female aspects. Um, it has to do with water, receptivity, it has to do with fluids, the body, uh, uh, blood of the body. Um, and in nature, it would be, you know, the darker compostable materials underneath, you know, a tree or in a garden, <clears throat> those darker root energies. Um, it has to do with a holistic paradigm, you know, something that's encompassing, it has to do with cooperation, with caring from those emotional uh, standpoints. Whereas the yang, uh, this would be the more male um, in, in the sense of uh, this, this practicum. And so this has to do with light, fire, energy has to do with giving. In Chinese medicine, we would say it has to do more with the qi rather than the yin and the blood. Um, it's very reductionistic, it's competitive, it's very goal setting. And I think we can see that within us, <clears throat> these types of behaviors on everything that we do, there's going to be an element of each of these sides to who we are and to the people are in our lives. And uh, the, the thing about it is, is you know, you, if you go too far in one direction, you're inevitably going to have a kickback where the other side starts to pick up. And so, for instance, last night I was talking to Nikki on the phone and I said, oh, I have got to go exercise. It has been three or four days since I've been out and I've been really moving. I exercise every morning, but it's yoga and stretching and 
calisthenics, I needed to get out and move in the sunshine. And um, I said, so I've got to go do something this evening. And what was happening there is I was becoming more yin. I was slowing down and the energy of my body needed to be released. I needed that physical release of really moving the oxygen through my body, which is a much more young experience and then as i was able to release that and i did i got out and did some exercise last night as i was able to release that not push myself too hard but release some of that oh i slept so well last night <laughs> and so as we get into a deep sleep that way that's a very yin activity and so you can see i hope you know just in that one simple example how it is that we're able to move from from yin into yang and how there's a little bit of each all the time and everything that we're doing so i want to share this with you because um this is foundational right here to the practice and theory of traditional Chinese medicine. And again, I just love it because I think it's incredibly poetic. Um, and if you let your mind go with this information and really start looking in your environment for ways that this is demonstrated, like right now I'm looking out the window and it's winter time in Flagstaff, which is in the mountains. So it's cold. And um, I see out here an aspen tree that, um, if we didn't know better, if we just took a quick glance at it, we wouldn't know if it was dead or alive. But in fact, what it is, is it's dormant. And uh, the outer expression of leaves and foliage, they're gone right now. And that's appropriate because it's winter time. If that were all out there, what would happen is all of that water within the leaves would freeze. And so the wisdom of nature is, is that we allow this recession of energy. Things go to a more yin capacity. They recede into the tree's roots. And this is where the tree builds its energy from deep within the earth. And then as spring comes, what we see are the little buds that come. And from those buds, they pull from deep within the energy of that tree and they allow the, the leaves to flourish out. And it's a safe and warm time. The chance of freezing is, is not very great. And so it's a safe time for there to be a very young activity where photosynthesis is happening. And the tree is then taking energy from the environment, from from the sun. So you can see this inner relationship and how that sets the tree up then for growth. And then in the in the fall, as we move into that season, that's where the energy begins to seep back in and we let the leaves go again. So it's a beautiful cyclical thing. And it's really neat because it's how we are as humans too. And I, I want to say that it's kind of um it's an interesting thing that we do where we keep ourselves so busy during the cold winter holiday season. And when in fact, um, we should probably be taking the cue from, you know, the squirrels and the bears, um, uh, even the reptiles, where they go inward and they, they use that as this deep, deep recovery time of rest and not pushing too hard. So I want you to think about that next year as you maybe get into the holiday season of balancing, not pushing yourself so hard because in terms of what is energetically appropriate for you, and this is of course, if you're living in the Northern Hemisphere, if you're down in Australia, it's a different story. Uh, their Christmas time is of course, when it's very warm and summery. But for Northern Hemisphere people, the, the winter time of Christmas is a time when we really push ourselves um, and uh, we sometimes burn the candle at both ends and you can really set a person up for just real bad colds and flus and exhaustion. So just keep that in mind um, as you kind of move through things. So, okay, that's, that's a little bit about yin-yang theory. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the five elements now. So, Five element theory is an interesting thing. It's not perfect from a practical standpoint, but it's pretty darn strong. When we talk about Chinese medicine, we're talking about a practice that is uh, reckoned to be between, around 5,000 years old. So this is an old, old practice of medicine, but it is a theoretical construct, and, and there are some ways in which it really is tight, and then there, there are a few places where it's a little bit loose. So um, the five elements are associated with many different attributes of a person. And so first what I want to 
what is show here are some examples of what that is. So you'll see across the top of this slide here, I've got elements and that's in the blue part. And then on the left side in gray, I've got different attributes that are going to be associated with a given element. So um, when we look at uh, it's fire, earth, metal, water, wood, and that actually is set up in the creation cycle. And I'll get to that in a minute. But the, the reason I have it set up that way is those actually, as we go down from fire, earth, metal, water, wood, each of those pushes the next by being the mother to the next element. So I just want to say that real fast. So emotionally, um, when we look at the fire element, and the organs that are associated with that in Chinese medicine, we're looking at the heart and pericardium. Um, and then that would be considered the yin elements. Uh, so the more, um, the deeper elements, if you will, the deeper organs that are associated with the fire element. And then we're also talking about the small intestine and something that's called the triple burner. And what the triple burner is, is it's not really an organ. It's actually an energetic profile. And it is the energy that runs from the upper uh, chest down to the lower abdomen. And so it's a flow of energy between all of these regions of the body. And then uh, what we are uh, moving into the next would be the earth element. And that is the spleen and stomach. Now I wanna say here that the spleen in Chinese medicine, the domain of that is not so much the way we think of the spleen in um, uh, Western biomedicine, but it's kind of more the domain of the pancreas. And so um, I wanna be a little bit clear on that. <clears throat> next uh, is the metal element. And this is lung and large intestine in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and that's a pretty good correlation right there. Um, the water element is the kidneys and bladder. And then the wood element is the liver and gallbladder. And I think it's important for me to say right now that we need to remember, like I said, this is like a 5,000 year old medicine. And sometimes the translation of what the Chinese character is for a given organ um, does not convey and completely line up with the Western biomedical model of say the liver or the gallbladder. I mean, how often in Western medicine do we talk about the emotional aspect of the liver? We don't, that's not a common thing that we do. So I just want you to kind of have an open mind here and don't be super hard and steadfast that, oh, okay, it says liver, so that means my liver. It's more than that and it's less than that. So I just have to preface that as well. But it's neat because we do talk about the emotions in Chinese medicine. And so um, it, when we're talking about the fire element um, and we're talking about the emotional content of that, when uh, that is joyful, that's joyfulness. In Chinese medicine, the heart is the emperor. It's the, it's the, it's the ruler of the emotions. And so every emotion that we feel has to go through the heart and, and be judged by the heart, if you will. And so we want to have a heart, uh, emotional, joyful content. And when we feel balanced, when we feel well rested, when we are doing things that we enjoy, enjoy, we are in a place of joyfulness. And so um, a healthy heart is represented by a joyful spirit. Uh, so that's really nice. Um, the earth element, uh, again, we're talking here about, uh, you know, kind of the domain of the pancreas and the stomach. And when a person tells me, oh, God, Srika, you know, I just, uh, I go to sleep and I just lay there and I ruminate. I just can't stop thinking about the day I get on an idea and I can't stop thinking about it or I get a song stuck in my head that will just be with me for days. One of the places I'm thinking to support that person is going to be in some aspect of the earth element because they're overthinking, there's a pensiveness about things and they're flat out stressing and they're just not letting something go. The earth element in Chinese medicine has so much to do with a sense of feeling grounded. Again, a sense of feeling safe, having a place within this world, feeling a home within this world, and feeling very comfortable within it. And when we don't have that happening, what's happening then is that the earth element um, is 
unsettled. We don't feel grounded. And our mind starts getting very involved with this. So we don't need that. Um, but that is how the earth element, that's an emotional content of how we would see that displayed if it were out of balance. The lung and large intestine, let's think about what that does. The lung and large intestine on a physical level, it's about taking in what we would call the air chi, uh, the oxygen, um, and expelling it. When uh, things come into the large intestine, they're to be expelled from the body. It's also the last place of, of where we do pull things into the system. Um, and so the, the whole... Um, the function of the metal element is is of letting go and anytime I'm working with someone and they just seem to be in such a deeply sad place you know they feel like at the end of the day after a really hard day they're not frustrated um, you know they they're not worried about things but they're sad um, or if we know that there has been some kind of emotional disturbance that has really left someone sad and they're not getting over it, we definitely want to look at how we can help to support that person through the metal element. Um, so sadness and grief are the emotion of the metal element, an ability to let things go and to move on with life. Uh, when we get into the water element, again, this is the kidneys and the bladder. <clears throat> And when in the water element, <clears throat> when we're looking at the five elements, the water element is the foundation for everything. We need strong water to have a strong body. And it makes sense because when you think about, um, when you think about um, the aspect of water from a global perspective, the earth itself is about 70% water. In turn, it's interesting, the human body is pretty close to that percentage as well. And so when the water is not flowing, when there's not enough, um, these are things that are going to have impact on the person's adrenal health. We're going to see you know, quite a potential for adrenal burnout, adrenal fatigue. Um, and what happens when, when we feel insecure that way? We feel fear, we feel worry. These are very physical aspects that, um, that uh, come forth when our body doesn't feel secure that way. And so for this person, I'd be definitely wanting to work on the kidneys and the body. You know, when a person's having sense of anxiety, um, <clears throat> we definitely want to work on, on uh, that water aspect for that person. In, you know, functional medicine, we'd be saying, oh, we need to work on, you know, the adrenal health and probably the thyroid health a bit. Um, so that's how that would parlay. And then the wood element, um, this is the domain of the liver and gallbladder. And um, it has a lot to do with our boundaries and a sense of feeling um, good about what's going on in our life. And sometimes in life, uh, we have things that are happening, maybe on a long-term scale or maybe just immediately where we feel stifled and things aren't going the way we want them to. That lends itself to a lot of frustration. Um, I know what's very common with women is as they move into the start of their period or as they're going through their perimenopausal experience or even the early phases of menopause, what can happen is that they, they kind of always feel frustrated. Um, there's, there's a sense of just, oh, things aren't going the way I want them to. And so in that instance, we definitely want to work on the wood element. Um, and I have to say, that's a very, very common presentation from my perspective as a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. That's incredibly um, common. I had a wonderful um, instructor when I was in school. Uh, he lives in Japan now, and, uh, but he was a chiropractor, acupuncturist, and a Buddhist monk. And I just loved him so much. And um, I remember one day in class him saying, you know, it's interesting to kind of reconsider the PMS presentation that women have. Um, we often, will kind of almost put blame or, or discount it or something. And, um, you know, it, when we're talking about a woman's experience that way. And he said, you know, well, how about if we consider it that as a woman is moving into, you know, the start of her cycle and she starts to feel that, that she's actually in a place where she is 
truly allowing herself to feel the things that she kind of stuffs down the rest of the month. It's like the gloves are off a little bit. And coming from a man, um, I was blown away by hearing him say this because uh, that was pretty far reaching in my opinion of, of what most men would, would recognize just because they don't live in a female body. Um, so that definitely <laughs> elevated him in my eyes, you know, for his ability to have that, that broader perspective on it. But it was interesting. I was also with some friends this weekend and they're the age I am. I mean, we're in our, you know, early mid forties and it's that kind of perimenopausal experience. And what I heard these gals saying was that, um, moving into this phase of their life, they realize that they're kind of just saying a little bit more what's on their heart rather than stuffing it. And in both of these instances, um, it's a little bit of freedom that comes from that. And I'm not saying one should go out and go crazy. I think it feels better if as life comes, you're not so emotionally perturbed by it. Um, to me, that's best. I mean, it really is. Uh, just from your own um, perspective of self. Um, however, as we get older and the gloves come off a little bit, uh, there is maybe sometimes more of a proclivity toward just saying it how it is and letting letting the chips fall where they may. So I'm not I, I'm not placing judgment on that one way or another. But it is an interesting thing that does happen. So but when I do see that happening, I really look at how we can help to soften that experience for someone because then they end up feeling sometimes, you know, bad about how it, you know, affects their family or whatever. So it's, it's just better if we can all get along. Um, so that's, that's the wood element there. Um, so there are other attributes, though, uh, that we can find here uh, that I think are just so neat. So uh, when we look at the taste, so one of the things on my intake form for my patients is I say, I want you to rate from one to five where your tastes lie, the things that you like the most. And I have to say, I'd, about 95% of the time with a Western audience, um, it's either going to be sweet or salty that's the number one flavor that they go for. Whereas in someone from, you know, even, even Europe, um, of which I consider very close to the United States, but certainly from other cultures, it's usually not sweet and salty. And what, what that says to me, because here it is, we're talking about energetics, right? And I believe that what we reach for are the foods that, that help to uh, balance out what's going on in our lives. And so when I see sweet, what we're doing then is we're trying to self-medicate the earth. We're trying to help ourselves to feel more grounded. And also, um, sweet is, uh, you know, in... In nature, if you know, you bump into some honey or you're eating berries, the carbohydrate content, the immediate carbohydrate content of that is going to lift you up. It's going to give you some immediate energy. And so when I see sweet being the main thing that someone is really reaching for all the time, I think, okay, we've got to work on helping them to source a deeper place of energy within them. Um, it, sweet has its place. I mean, don't I don't want to say that. But when it's the thing that we've been raised on, uh, and most of us have, you know, we're raised uh, as babies um, uh, on sweet formula. Uh, then we go to rice cereals, uh, pureed fruits, and we really develop a palate of sweet as being the energy producer for us. The issue with that is that we never learn to lean on our innate uh, energies, uh, and we, we become what we call now in uh, functional medicine more of a, a sugar burner as opposed to someone who leans on uh, their innate fat reserves and being a fat burner. And so uh, when I see sweet, I think, okay, we got to get this person probably resting better. Um, we've got to change the diet so that the actual palate isn't reaching for sweets so much. Um, likewise, when we see salty, salty is the flavor of the water element. And again, that's that kidney adrenal energy. It's somebody trying to, trying to nourish themselves at that deep, deep level. And so I, I understand why people have those two, especially in Western society where all we're doing is being dinged all the time. It's, you know, we hear our email chime in on us. We have a text message chime in on us, a Skype call chime in on us. And, you know, it's just incessant. Uh, 
um, and every time that happens, we feel it at the level of um, our deeper energies. We may not recognize it as such, but it's true. So um, there's always this kind of uh, pinging that is happening um, at the energetic level for us. And so I'm not surprised everybody's as tired as they are. And then we try and self-medicate with a lot of caffeine and, you know, just, oh, it's a mess. <laughs> So, uh, so when I see those two as the main, it's like, okay, we've got some work to do for this person's deeper energies. Uh, the other flavors that we see here, I hardly ever see put uh, someone put bitter as their first favorite flavor. And let's be honest, I mean, the bitter flavor is something that isn't, it's not a very comfortable place to be. But as I change my diet over the years um, and going from a carb burner type diet to someone who uh, eats a much more full spectrum diet that allows for um, uh, the deeper nutrition found in plants and animal proteins and, and grains that have been properly prepared, um, my palate goes looking for the bitter flavor. My palate goes looking for the sour flavor. And boy, that isn't how I used to be. I was all sweet and salty. So it's neat to see that transformation happen over time. And it's not just me, I see it happen with my patients too. It's really neat. Um, the spicy flavor uh, relates to the metal element. And I want you to think about that for a minute. You know, if you've had a cold and you've got all this phlegm and uh, don't you find that that you do maybe reach for some spicy salsa or a little bit of cayenne pepper? That actually, it's an expectorant. It's, it helps us to open up uh, the lung energy, the metal energy. And so in doing so, what you're doing is trying to uh, self-medicate in that regard, which is pretty pretty nifty. And then again, yes, the sour flavor, that correlates to the liver and gallbladder, the wood element. <clears throat> and that is something that um, I see developing in people more and more, the more they bring fermented foods into their diet, because fermented foods are um, at their heart, uh, rather tart and it's a neat thing to see that develop uh where a person begins nourishing that and um it it's what they start going for rather than uh, maybe what they'd been using which were more the sweet and uh, even salty flavor profiles so <clears throat> likewise what we have here is an energetic flow uh, all of this also relates to the seasons and so uh, the fire element uh, relates to summer. The earth element relates to late summer, that kind of period between fall and summer. <clears throat> the metal element relates to autumn. The water element is winter, and then the spring is wood, um, <clears throat> you know, where we have this blossoming back out, like I was talking about the aspen tree outside. Um, likewise, <clears throat> there's an energetics that relates to all of this. So the fire element is fire. The earth element uh, has a lot to do with the transportation and the transformation of fluids within our body. And when that doesn't happen because there isn't strong fire to move that, what happens is we can start presenting with damp presentations. And that's where a person can have, uh, you know, maybe joint pain or muscle pain <clears throat> that they feel when maybe the barometric pressure changes and they have a storm coming. Anytime someone tells me that their joints hurt more when, the, you know, that there's a change in weather coming, coming I'm thinking, we need to support the earth element for this person. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, as we go from this damp presentation in terms of a seasonal thing, we then need to dry out. Um, and that's going to be the metal element, the lung and large intestine again. And isn't it interesting that, uh, you know, the, as we move into autumn, that is where people do tend to start catching colds. Um, but it's in part because as we move into autumn, people also start moving into the holidays. And we, we start off with, uh, you know, we've got... Halloween. <laughs> and Halloween's a mess. Um, it just creates so much phlegm in people because the, the sugariness of that candy overloads the earth element. And so a lot of dampness is created. And that dampness then is expressed through the metal element with a lot of phlegm, uh, you know, colds and that sort of thing. So I hope you're starting to see a little thread here of how you can see how the behavior of one thing has such uh, an interrelationship with outcome and how the body tries to clear that. 
And, you know, there's that old saying, what is it, road hard and put away wet. So you played hard in the summertime, in the late summer, you know, and, and so it's important that we want to dry something out before we put it away for the winter. Because the winter is a time of cold, recession, you know, deep energy going back in. And so uh, we need to have that season of dryness in the metal to work with that at the season of the fall. And then as we have as we have put away the energies, we've really let them build in this deep, receptive, quiet time of winter, as the days get longer, uh, what ends up happening is we begin to have that shift of energy. And that shift of energy is the springtime coming. And that's the wood element. And, and what happens with spring is we get a lot of wind. And I think we all know about that. Oh my gosh, I've about been blown off this mountain here in Flagstaff in the springtime. And um, we really get the four seasons up here. And so uh, the, the springtime is a season of wind. Um, also, there are sounds that are associated uh, with each of these different um, five elements. So uh, the sound of laughter, uh, joy, uh, is the sound of the fire element. Uh, singing uh, is the sound of the earth element. So if you, have, if you know someone um, who has like a sing-songy quality to their voice, uh, you know, that's a person who's maybe quite in balance with their earth element. The metal element, um, again, with, with grieving, letting go. So what we can hear is, you know, a real crying tone, a real melan melancholy tone in someone's voice um, if the metal element is needing some support. Um, in the water element, a groaning tone. And that can almost, even if a person is just being a normal water element person, they can have sometimes a gravelly, groany tone to their voice. But when think about it, when you're deeply, deeply tired, you've just been woken up from sleep and you were not ready to wake up, what's the first sound that comes out of you? It's a groan. It's, oh, I'm not ready for this. And so um, groaning is the sound of the water element, possibly needing some balance. Um, and then the wood element, <laughs> when things are out of balance, that's when we can get into shouting. <laughs> <laughs> when you know we're feeling frustrated about things so that's a good sign that maybe we need to tone down the wood element now also each of these organ systems has different bodily tissues that are um, assigned to them what we would almost call the flower so um, in the fire element it's the blood vessels and the face color uh, those are those are good things that we can look at uh, to see the vitality of a person uh, in relation to the fire element uh, the earth element it's the muscles a uh, good tone to the muscles or flabby muscles or not having really any muscles um, and the lips so when I see someone with really full, luscious lips and they haven't been, you know, that way because of injectables, I just think, oh, gosh, they are an earth element kind of person. Um, the metal element uh, correlates to the skin and body here. So when I'm working on someone with acupuncture, <clears throat> they may be have they may have a lot of body hair I know when I was younger um, I had a lot of leg hair and um, and I'm tall and I'm thin and um, some friends called me Sasquatch because my mom would not let me shave my legs <laughs> when I was younger and it's interesting because during that period of time every year I would get bronchitis and like really badly and I, it's funny because you look back on your life and you think, okay, I can see how that would have happened. We ate a lot of sugary dairy. Um, we lived in a very cold, damp place. Um, our family was actually in the newspaper for eating as much Baskin Robbins ice cream as we did. And so, I mean, we put it away. Um, and when you do that, that overwhelms the earth element. And like we talked before, when the earth element becomes overwhelmed because of damp and sugary foods, so pasteurized milk uh, with a bunch of sugar in it, that's going to be very damp forming. That overwhelms the system, and then the lungs try and clear that. And we get a lot of phlegm that we produce. So in my instance, it was bronchitis every year. But my, my metal element was also overwhelmed by this. And one of the ways that that was represented as well for me was my, I have a lot of body hair. 
And it's interesting now, I don't have these colds, I don't have that type of presentation, and I don't body wax, um, but I don't have the amount of hair that I had when I was younger. So my constitution has shifted over time, which is very interesting, and that happens with people. Um, so let's see here, uh, the water element has to do with strong bones and, and lots of head hair. And so, um, you know, we think of women who become osteoporotic, sometimes as early as in their 30s and 40s. That's a real decline that is being shown in that deeper water element for that person. So uh, then we really want to focus on that function for that person. Uh, the tendons and ligaments, so the sinews we call them in Chinese medicine, and the nails, that's the domain of the wood element. And so when a person is, um, when a person has super tight connective tissue, like a really tight iliotibial band along the side of their legs, um, or uh, they snap a tendon, heaven forbid, something like that, that's when I really say, oh my gosh, we have got to get after nourishing the wood element for this person. And one of the best places to do, to do that is by using a really uh, good bone broth that's been made with all the tendons and ligaments. I know Nikki has a great class on how to make bone broth. And in that instance, that's definitely what we'd wanna do for that person. Each of these elements also has color associated with it. So we've got red for fire, no surprise, orange, yellow for earth. Um, we have white for metal, blackish gray for water, and green for wood. And so all of us kind of have a tone to us. Um, and sometimes we can really especially see it around our eyes. And so as a practitioner, that's something that I look to a lot to see more about the constitution of, of what that person has going on. Um, so that's another way you can kind of assess yourself. And then signs of physical imbalance in each of these elements. Um, so in the fire element, if it's really emotionally imbalanced, we're going to have a lot of grieving. It's just going to be tough on the heart. And it, when it comes to the earth element, when that's imbalanced, uh, we can have hiccups. And that, gosh, I remember in elementary school, someone who just had hiccups and they would not stop. Um, that is obviously the diaphragm being in spasm, but in Chinese medicine, we'd be really looking at, okay, how do we support the energy of the earth element for this person? Uh, the metal element, again, the lung and large intestine, when that's way out of balance, you know, we're gonna have coughing, and that can be chronic cough, it can be acute cough, it depends on what the presentation is, but we see that it's out of balance relation to the lung and large intestine. The water element, when a person is depleted in that deeper adrenal energy, uh, what they're a person who's running around feeling chilly all the time quite often so uh, there's that and then in the wood element um, the person can present with a lot of spasms um, and that you know it has to do with the ability of those muscles to relax and if the tendons and ligaments are super tight because that person's not stretching or they have work that keeps them you know really sedentary and they're not moving their chi then uh, these are these are ways that they can really present with spasms so we'd want to support the earth element that way I'm sorry the wood element and then the body fluid associated. I mean, there are so many ways you can talk about the five elements. The body fluid associated with uh, the fire element is our sweat. Uh, the body fluid that is associated with the, with the earth element is kind of a sticky saliva. Um, with the metal element, it could be a runny nose. Um, with the water element, it's very thin saliva. Um, and then with the wood element, it has to do with tears. Those are the, and it's <clears throat> in part because the flower for the wood element is the eyes. And obviously the tears are there to help lubricate that. Um, so that's some components related to the five elements there. It's a lot, isn't it? Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I had touched on this uh, a few minutes ago. It's a relationship of the five element components. Now, this is where things start getting tricky. And the one that you see there, the generating cycle, the Shung cycle, we would call it in Chinese medicine, uh, that's the one I'm mainly going to keep us on. Um, but you can see that there is this interrelationship as we follow the arrows of a control cycle as well as an insulting cycle um, where. In the generating cycle, earth generates metal, 
which generates water, which generates wood, which generates fire, which generates earth. And those all pretty much make sense to me. Um, you know, when we think about water, we need to have water to generate wood and to create, you know, wood. <laughs> and then we need the wood to build a fire, to have the fire have something it can run on. And when we uh, have this fire, you know, ash is generated, it's rich in, in different minerals and, and nutrient bits, and that goes back into the earth. And um, so the earth absorbs that, and then the earth gives rise to the metal. So the, this is the, the, uh, the mineral aspect of of what is within the earth's soil now it's the metal going into water that i have always felt like that's one of the weaker spots of the five element paradigm but <laughs> i there are a couple things that i want to say about that uh, one is that uh researchers have recently found that at the earth's crest that there's water uh it's deep, deep, deep down below the ocean. Uh, in this very compressed state, it's water that is compressed in basically like a metallic form. And it's just a matter of pressure being released that will allow it to go to water. And so how the Taoist you know, uh, practitioners of, of yore knew this, I don't know. I don't know that they did. But um, they were able to correlate that water arises from metal. Uh, one of the other ways that I think about that in a more um, uh, practical sense is that um, when we consume a lot of uh, reverse osmosis water, which I know a lot of people, that's the main kind of water that they drink. Well, this is a water that is demineralized. And um, the very important component of mineralization is needed for our bodies and then also for the bacteria uh, that, that would be nourished by that water. So occasionally a little bit of reverse osmosis water is okay, but if it's the main thing that somebody is e uh, drinking, it's eventually going to have a leaching effect on the body where the body then can become the reserve uh, helping to balance out the lack of minerals that are that are in that water. I've seen this played out in um, the water kefir that I make, and that's a probiotic beverage. And I um, I teach a class on this uh, around traditional food preparation methods. And I've been working with this for many years. And um, I've seen different information about, oh, if you're using reverse osmosis water to feed the water kefir, and what water kefir is, is just a symbiotic community of beneficial bacteria and yeast. And um, so what you do is you give them water and sugar, and then they convert the sugar that's in that water into a probiotic-rich beverage, um, which is all great. Um, and I love it, and I use it for many things. But... Um, if you're using a reverse osmosis water, even if you add back in liquid minerals over time, there is going to be a degradation of the bacterial profile and it's going to become weaker and weaker and weaker. And um, given that researchers have found that the human body uh, is more bacteria than it is actual human cells, it behooves us to maybe take a look at what I would consider almost the canary in the coal mine of a, of a counter-created probiotic beverage like that, see the effect of um, the lack of true mineralization structure within that water and its inability to truly nourish the bacterial, uh, healthy bacterial species that are there within uh, that ferment. And take that and say, you know what? Given that we're mostly bacteria too, that's probably not the best type of water for us either because it's not generating minerals for us. It's not, it's not giving us that to help nourish our body at that deep reserve of what the water element is within our body, that kidney adrenal energy. Whenever I'm working with patients and we're talking about adrenal fatigue, one of the very important components is, is a person gets into a real vicious cycle where they're fatigued and they're they're not able to relax deeply enough when it's time to eat and time to rest for them to begin to release hydrochloric acid at the level of the stomach 
to bring in the minerals and put them to use in their body that they're eating in their food. And so what happens is, is a person gets into a real vicious cycle where they're not replenishing the minerals that are needed, not just for our bones, but for our adrenals themselves. That's a very important part of recovering a person's adrenal health. So when we talk about these things, I'm, I'm hoping you can see that, that there are such important components that we need to bring together to really nourish ourselves. So that's a little bit about the relationship of the five elements in that regard. And um, if you have questions about the control cycle or the insulting cycle, um, there's lots of information online about that. Um, you can also shoot me an email, but I don't want to muddy the waters with getting too complicated here. But just know that those cycles, uh, you know, control and insulting, those have very negative connotations. But in fact, it's a way of our body keeping us in balance. I mean, if we were just... If we just slept all the time, we'd never get anything done. We need to have something acting on us to get us up. And so it's all about interrelationship and a balance between all those components. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. And let's talk a little bit about these elements uh, specific to what they are. Um, and this is where I'd like you to maybe kind of see a little bit about yourself or someone else that you know. Um, and I'll give some examples of celebrities uh, who kind of fit the element that I'm talking about here, just so you have a little something to tag on to. Uh, so the fire element person, when that person's in balance, you know, they're energetic, passionate, uh, they're dramatic people, they're joyful. Um, and they loquacious, you know, they speak a lot. They speak clearly from the heart. They're very expressive. Uh, they're also enthusiastic. Uh, they're great leaders uh, and they have an ability to really inspire people, uh, in terms of like the physical attributes of these people. Uh, they can have kind of a pointy shaped head, pointy nose and kind of a pointy chin. Uh, their face may be rounder uh, with maybe wider lips, uh, you know, easy to smile. And, um, uh, and also uh, their, their shape is one that may be kind of stronger across the, um, the shoulders and maybe tapering a bit to the hips. They walk quickly uh, and they tend to speak in high tones. Um, if that person's in excess, um, so again, when we talk excess and efficiency, this is where we're talking about yang and yin. Uh, so excess would be kind of more the yang version of the fire element person, whereas the deficient person would be a little bit more the yin, the recessive version of that person. So fire excess type, generally intelligent, meticulous, inquisitive, someone who's like a constant student. Um, they have a tendency to speak too much or sometimes too quickly. Uh, their head shape can resemble kind of a pear, um, and they may have a very ruddy complexion, again, that redness of the fire element. Uh, their build is generally healthy, thin. Um, they work hard at their projects um, and tend to do best in non-manual labor. Um, and uh, when they're out of balance, there may be a tendency to respiratory issues and, of course, issues related to the cardiovascular system. A person who's kind of more of a fire deficient type, they may also have a red complexion, but they can move to pale really easily if they're overtaxed. Um, they tend to be thin and also may have a pear-shaped head. Uh, they're clever, but not overly agile, and they don't always have a lot of great stamina. Uh, they can tend to nervousness. They're very sensitive people, and they can be quite self-absorbed. Um, they have a real tendency toward insomnia and anxiety. Um, you know, it's that fire, uh, it's deficient and it's flaring up on them. Uh, they have maybe a tendency to being a little bit more introverted and uh, they may have a tendency to respiratory and digestive issues. So an example, just in terms of appearances, because I don't know these people personally, but in terms of appearances, um, that would be like an Audrey Hepburn type. We think about this cute little pointed nose, pointed chin. Uh, Annette Benning, I think, is a really good example of that. Charlize Theron, she also has this just beautiful face that's got these cute little pointy bits to it. And then I think uh, from a man's perspective, I think Johnny Depp is also a good example of um, a person who's more of a fire element. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And the earth element. <clears throat> So I'm not a follower of the Lord of the Rings, but um, Bildo Babbins, um, you know, someone who has this really kind of bulbous nose, maybe kind of a bulbous kind of stubby fingers, you know, 
just someone who's kind of round in appearance, um, that would be kind of your earth element person. So these people, when they are in balance, they're super harmonious, they're empathic, they're caring, they're nurturing, they're reliable and compassionate. They really tend to enjoy gardening and crafty things in the home. You know, you can just imagine this person running around in their apron and just kind of making everything right. You just want to be at their house because they, they make it right. Um, the hands and the body, the neck on these people, again, they're short, the face is square. Again, that bulbous nose, nose you know, fleshy ears, uh, slow and deliberate movement. They're not in a big hurry to do anything. Um, when a person is uh, earth excess, some more kind of a uh, that's out of balance to the young. Uh, this person can tend to overweight. Uh, they in generally, they're enjoying sweet foods and carbohydrates, but they can also sometimes be picky about their foods, but they have a tendency to eat excessively. Um, a ruddy yellowish complexion with a real full mouth, I'd spoken about that earlier, square face, and a strong jaw on this person. Uh, they can be very verbose. Uh, they speak and think simply with a tendency toward, forgetful, toward forgetfulness. When we think of dampness, that can be kind of uh, the dampness of the earth element. Sometimes that can kind of cloud the, the mental aspect. They're not terribly strong-willed. Um, they may have some difficulty making decisions. Uh, they may have a tendency to joint pain and nerve problems. So when I was talking about, you know, a person who really notices when the weather changes, that their joints really get to hurting and the muscles hurt, uh, that's a real sign of earth imbalance. Um, they tend to, they need to be mindful of liver and kidney diseases, and they can also have a pretty strong libido. I actually had a talk about this with one of my patients last night. <laughs> so, um, so that's uh, the kind of thing that, believe it or not, people really do deal with that. Um, and so then let's see here on our earth deficiency side, uh, that person can have a yellow complexion, weak digestion, but often a strong appetite. Um, and this needs to be controlled. Um, we, that can overwhelm the system in a person who doesn't have enough energy to move uh, the transportation and transformation of those fluids. Um, and then we've got someone also who has a real tendency possibly toward a skinny build uh, when they're deficient in the earth element. Um, and uh, it's because they're not able to put that nutrition to use. Uh, and I think we've all seen these people, the skinny fat people who have no tone to their musculature. Uh, when I see someone like that who's kind of sallow complected, they're kind of lethargic, um, apathetic, um, and they're skinny fat that way, it's like, whoa, we need to work with the earth element. And in you know, modern biomedicine, functional medicine, in that instance, I'd also be thinking about this might be a person we really need to focus on gut integrity for this person. Um, <clears throat> They can have, but in spite of that, they can have a heightened libido. Um, if uh, they act on that, though, it really can be very draining to their essence, whereas with the earth excess person, that may not, they won't have as much of an issue in that regard. Now, if this person's imbalanced with the wood element, so that's the liver, the gallbladder, sometimes a sense of frustration and things not going right, they can become nervous and irritable. And um, they have a tendency toward loose stools, fatigue, and food sensitivity. So again, that goes into the leaky gut pattern that, you know, from that perspective, we would be considering, oh, we need to tonify the earth for this person to help to support that. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. And, oh, the metal element. Um, this is a person who, oh, and I want to tell you some examples of the earth element. You know, it's interesting because the earth element is one that even if a person is kind of an earth element person in celebrity status, we don't see a lot of that because someone who's kind of square, slow uh, in their movements, um, grounded that way, that doesn't tend to be someone who's going to be a celebrity status. And even if they are, they're going to try and counterbalance that with a lot of activity, changing their diet, and make themselves look different than what their natural constitution is. Um, but to that end, so I had to put on my thinking cap <laughs> and really go dig deeply for this. Um, <clears throat> so Kate Winslet, I think by her... Um, I think in her natural capacity of who she is, I would say that she would be an earth element tending toward a fire element because she has those cute pointy qualities to her, um, to her um, 
face as well and just such a wonderful warm uh, look about her but she's got many earth qualities that I think she really does have to counter through lifestyle things so that she doesn't put on too much weight um also Patrick Swayze I mean we look at photographs of Patrick Swayze he really had that bulbous nose he had a real fleshiness to his tone and it's very interesting because I always think about this stuff um <laughs> he ended up passing from complications of pancreatic cancer and so we see that for a long time his pancreas his earth element was really struggling and maybe he wasn't doing things in his life that helped to counterbalance that um and maybe he was i don't know i'm not here to place blame or anything like that but i can't help but see those threads in people um and then another is mindy kaling um she also has kind of a squarish build to her that way so those are some examples celebrity wise of earth element people so the metal element <clears throat> Anytime I think of a metal element person, I think of David Bowie, and um, who I just love so much um, in terms of appearance. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind as we talk about a metal, metal element person. Um, in terms of who they are, faithful, brave, intellectual, very self-disciplined, detail-oriented, structured, organized, methodical, creative people. And if that isn't David Bowie, I don't know what is. <laughs> So uh, that's who they are when they are in balance. Uh, they have a tendency to thin lips, thin tissue on the hands and on the eyelids. Uh, they are very balanced. They have good structure to the face. They have a handsome face. Their voice is bright. Their gait is swift and it's energetic. I mean, this person knows what they want. They're going there. They're getting it done. Um, when a person is uh, a kind of a young presentation of metal, uh, metal excess, uh, they're going to be generally white complexioned, again, uh, David Bowie, uh, may have an oval face. They could have broad shoulders. Uh, they may have a very strong digestive capacity, but not a lot of sexual energy. Um, and they may be very social and friendly, but not a super strong character. Um, so it could be someone who's very good at presenting themselves, but maybe in their personal relationships, uh, there's, there's maybe not going to be that deeper, uh, connection, that sense of groundedness that you would find in like an earth element person. These people are prone to heart diseases, emotional and nervous issues, asthma, and skin issues. Uh, the asthma makes sense. It's a metal element. So the lung and large intestine, um, but skin issues, this is an interesting thing because uh, the skin in Chinese medicine is the flower of the lung and large intestine. <clears throat> and so when we see someone who um, is presenting with psoriasis or eczema um, or even, you know, pustular acne, this, this type of presentation, um, in Chinese medicine, we would always be looking at, you know, so how is the large intestine functioning um, and making sure that people are able to clear through that, that part of their digestive tract. And it's very neat that now biomedicine is recognizing, whoa, if a person is presenting, you know, with skin issues, we need to look and see what's going on internally for that person. So very neat how that works itself out. Uh, we lost another great artist uh, recently. It was Glenn Fry. He was one of the founders of the Eagles. And um, I was reading about, you know, why he died, uh, what seemed to be the issue there. And I remember thinking about Glenn Fry, even when I was like watching MTV as a teenager and thinking he's not the healthiest looking guy. <laughs> he just looked kind of dusky to me. And it turns out that Glenn Fry, uh, over the last couple of weeks, he has really struggled with uh, complications from rheumatoid arthritis, uh, from colitis, and pneumonia. So colitis and pneumonia, we can see the correlation there between the lung and large intestine. When we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, that's an autoimmune presentation, and that in Western biomedicine, we are recognizing now that that's a porosity within the large intestine and, and the small intestine. And we've got, we have uh, particles getting into the bloodstream that have not been properly digested because they're leaking out through the pores in a leaky gut presentation. So all three of those factors I looked at and I thought that all arises because he had such a weakness in the metal element and, um, and bless him so um anyway it's just you know when you start thinking about these things you can't help but start finding the threads in everybody 
and, and all different kinds of things. So I encourage you to do this. So if a person's metal deficient, uh, they are going to have a tendency toward being thin, possibly, uh, as I was explaining with myself when I was younger, excessive body hair. They're trying to keep themselves warm. They're trying to work on just holding in the energy there. Uh, they're going to have digestive uh, complaints, and they're going to easily contract colds and flus. That's no surprise there, um, you know, because we're talking about the lung. Um, and uh, they, when they become tired, they can become very irritable. They just don't have a lot of reserve to work with, um, but they can have a very strong will. They're going to try and make it happen, um, and they do have an easy decision-making capacity, uh, generally. And again, related to the large intestine, uh, these people can tend to develop hemorrhoids very easily, and they need to be super mindful of lower bowel and kidney disorders, as well as asthma and skin issues. And so um, I'm hoping you can see that thread there between all these different components related to the metal element. Um, some examples, my fave, David Bowie. Another fave of mine is Ralph Fine. Uh, he would be another good example of a metal element person. Uh, Robin Wright is a good example. Uh, and Daniel Day-Lewis. I mean, when we think of these people, they have very balanced uh, um, and direct visages about their face. Um, and you can just kind of see this tenacity within them. Uh, they, know, they know who they are. And um, it's really uh, the metal element people, I think, are very interesting to study. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. And the water element. <clears throat> so water, again, let's talk about the kidney adrenal function of a person, you know. Um, and I think of people I know personally who are water element people that you won't know, but I wish you did because then I would say, oh, think of this person, you know. So again, I had to dig a little bit deep for that, but that's okay. We'll go there. Um, so these people are strong-willed, but they have a real ability to go with the flow. I mean, think about that. When you're feeling really secure in who you are, it's cool. It doesn't matter what's going on around you. You can just go with the flow. Uh, you're not going to raise a ruckus about it. Um, they have good stamina. They're very determined. They're very self-sufficient um, because they've got that wonderful stamina that they can put to their mind, that they can put to their body. They may seem wise beyond their years or philosophical, uh, they have a tranquility about them. And again, it's that, you know, deep waters, or what is it? Deep waters run deep, something or other like that. You know, they've got a lot of reserve that they have to work with. Um, in terms of their appearances, uh, they can be people who have thick eyelids, uh, flesh on the back of the hands. This can be kind of fleshy back here. And their uh, jaw can be even a little bit fleshy too. Thicker eyebrows and fuller hair. Uh, their body type is full. Uh, their voice is relaxed and low. There's no stress in a voice who's, you know, in, behind a water element, um, who is in balance. Uh, when the person is experiencing, you know, excess kind of a young capacity with that, uh, they're going to have more of a tendency toward a lean build. Um, <clears throat> they are um, going to maybe have stiff but flexible muscles. Um, they could have a sooty, blackish complexion and round shaped eyes. I was on a webinar yesterday and the gal hosting it she had such round eyes and I thought oh water element um, there may they may appear severe but usually they're social and warm um, you can imagine if a person is really feeling very secure in who they are they're um, they're not going to be asking for people's assistance on things and so sometimes that can convey as being severe when in fact they might just be self-reliant uh, they may have a very strong libido that would make sense they've got the capacity for it uh, if their digestion is weak then they need to be extra mindful of taking care of that um, also they tend to be the work hard play hard uh, have a short but rich life kind of person and um, you know, thinking about it, I would say Jim Morrison from The Doors, he was probably a water element. Now that I think of it, I hadn't considered him until just now. Uh, they are prone to liver diseases and strokes. Um, now, if a person is water deficient, so that more yin aspect um, uh, and maybe lacking a bit, they may have a weak libido unless their wood energy is strong, at which time their libido would increase. Um, so say it's a woman who's a water element and as she moves out of her period and she's done with kind of the draining capacity of her cycle, she may find 
that as she moves into the start of the new cycle, uh, where she's not bleeding, um, that actually her libido increases. And so that could be how we would see that pattern for that person. Uh, they also can have a sooty blackish complexion. They may also have a round face, a very smart intellect, and really prefer careers that are very mentally driven. Uh, they generally do have good digestion, um, but they tend to have cold hands and feet and um, even a cool body. Um, and again, this has a lot to do with that adrenal energy to work with. Um, if that's weak, that the energy is going to be pulled in tight to the body. It's not going to be much to share with the extremities. Uh, prone to respiratory issues, but if this is overcome, then this can lead to robust, uh, robust energy for that person later in life. Uh, periods of overwork can present with really serious problems, so they need to keep an eye on the amount and the intensity of the work that they do. Um, and one of the ways that they can see that is dark gray rings under the eyes. That's how that can present. These people also can have circulatory and urinary problems, and uh, that will need special attention if they do, as well as edema, uh, which is a very watery uh, presentation in the body. Uh, and the domain of the water element in Chinese medicine is the knees and the, kid and the lower back, the kidney area. And so when a person comes in and um, I'm working with them and I'm feeling their pulse and the position that relates to the kidneys and urinary bladder is weak, uh, I'll ask them, you know, are you feeling fatigued in your back? Does it feel like it feels better if you're lying down or if you have heat on it? And oh gosh, eight times out of 10, they'll say, yes, it does. And then I'll say, okay, we need to work a little bit on helping to tonify the water element, help to warm that up and give it some energy. So, um, so that's kind of the, the water deficient person. Um, and, um, you know, the, the wood element is what we're going to go to now. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, the water element person. Um, that is, hold on here. The water element person would be, um, that was another one that was super, super hard to find. And ah, shoot, I forgot to put it on my notes. That was a tough one, um, but it was, oh, I know who it was. Uh, Pavarotti was one of them. And another was um, uh, Nicholas Cage and his uncle, um, the director, um, Cap, not Capra. It's an Italian name. I know you know it, and I can't think of it right now. It'll come to me. Um, but when we look at these people, um, we can see that they've got that kind of, that deeper stamina, that, and that sense of, I've got it, you know? I'm good. <laughs> So those are the kind of people that would be kind of a water element type. Um, and then finally, finishing with the wood element. Um, these are people who are really determined, they're challenge seeking, they do well under pressure, they're adventurous with a strong sense of purpose. In Ayurvedic medicine, we would call these people the wood element people who are imbalanced, that would be a pizza type. Um, a kapha type, uh, the fleshier type, that would be kind of a water uh, earth person. And uh, Vata, uh, the person who's thin and in their head has long, thin fingers, um, that would be, that would be um, kind of a metal type. Um, but a wood element is definitely a pitta type. Um, so these people, they tend to have a long face, trunk of body and fingers, they're all long. They have a strong jaw, strong brow bones. Uh, they have a bony build with shoulders that are tapering to the waist. Their speech is blunt and their gait is marching. Um, think of wood, you know, <clears throat> that's how it is. So a wood excess type, they, you know, when we look at blood typing, this is often a type O blood with a type A personality. And uh, they have kind of a greenish blue tinge to their coloration with a little bit of black even possibly. They tend to be stubborn and they want to make their own decisions on matters. Mm, wood. Uh, their muscles tend to be hard and tight and their body is strong. Uh, they can be very persistent in their efforts. Um, and this often leads to success and a habit of overwork as well. Uh, sometimes they can just push themselves way too hard again. Type A personality. 
Uh, they <clears throat> can have a very healthy appetite, um, but when things are going wrong, uh, they can have a tendency to stroke, to hypertension, to headaches, or to nervous, nervous issues around digestion. Uh, and that controlling cycle that we were talking about uh, when, with the five elements, this, uh, when a person has nervous issues around digestion, um, I think of the wood over acting on the earth and you know it could be a person who loses their appetite or when you know when they're stressed um, or they can have loose stool uh, when they get really stressed um, that's a that's an imbalance there between the earth and the wood elements now a wood deficient person often tends to be um, type A blood and they can be calm smart very sensitive but they don't have a lot of stamina they can have a tendency to really overthink issues. They're not super muscular, but they are generally lean. I think actually as I've aged, I think I've become kind of this wood deficient type. And when I am in balance, you know, uh, I'm able to really be determined and challenge seeking and that sort of thing. But when I get to feeling too depleted, I push myself too hard, uh, then I get into uh, patterns of, of deep fatigue as a result of it so i have to really watch myself uh and i'm not super muscular but i am i am lean uh we may seem weak in our digestion but not to a point of actual disease and that is true uh prone to emotional and nervous problems notably pms issues this is something that i really see with a lot of women um there's a whole theoretical construct around it but let me just say this much as a woman gets older and she has had periods, she's nursed babies, she has given birth, and then she's lived the rest of life, and especially the fast-paced life that we have now. What nourishes the wood is blood, and helps to keep it soft and pliable, and helps to keep it from flaring up with frustration and anger. And when a woman has become depleted over time, just through life activities, um, her wood element can become depleted. And her PMS and her perimenopausal situation and a menopausal situation can become much more uncomfortable at an emotional level uh, than it was when she was younger. And so this is, this is one of the ways that a lot of women do present with PMS issues as they hit their mid to late 30s and their 40s. Um, and also uh, hormonal headaches related to the cycle as well. And also headaches related to not getting enough sleep. Sleep is a time of real replenishment of that blood within our body. It nourishes the wood, uh, the liver. And when we don't rest well, uh, that keeps us uh, from being deeply nourished that way, calm, and it can be a real provoker of the headaches, especially headaches, you know, that run kind of this way, and then also the stress headaches that start in the neck and the shoulders. Uh, the whole body can look weak, but if they take good care of themselves with breathing and exercise techniques, they can have a really long life. And um, so this is the mindfulness around how to take care of yourself. For me, it's starting the day with meditative thought, with stretching and yoga, some calisthenics, uh, some spiritual reading. And um, everybody has, you know, their different ways of taking care of themselves. But I know when I began to adopt those practices, come hill or high water and do that every day, it was a game changer. So um, I just want to share that. So, okay, let's have a look-see here. We talked about a lot. <laughs> And so um, I'm giving you here, uh, just if you want to look into this a little bit more deeply, again, you can go online and you can start looking at this kind of stuff. Oh, and I wanted to tell you, some wood people, before I forget, uh, some good examples of wood people, Sigourney Weaver, um, Keanu Reeves, Hilary Swank, um, you know, these people who have these strong jaws and they've got this intensity about them. Those are, I think, very good examples of uh, the wood people. Um, so going back to uh, this information here, uh, The Web That Has No Weaver, that's a book that I read um, before I started studying Chinese medicine, and I knew I was going to embark on that master's program, and I wanted to kind of prep myself. So I got that book, and um, I cannot say enough good about 
that book. So if you want to study more about Chinese medicine, that's what I would that's what I would suggest. The other two that I have here, the foundations of Chinese medicine and the five elements and 10 stems, those are really kind of more at the level of the practitioner. And believe me, especially for the foundations book, you'll be paying for the level of the practitioner. That textbook is very expensive. And so um, if this has sparked an interest within you, go ahead and start with that first one. I think that um, I think you would enjoy that. So anyway, I want to thank you so much for taking this time. I hope it, I hope it wasn't too much, um, but I hope it gave you enough of a taste that you can hopefully start to see this in your environment. Um, and I'm open to questions now if anybody has any. Can you hear me, Sarika? Yeah, Nikki, thanks. Okay, perfect. That was awesome. Yeah. So the entire time I'm going, I wonder where I am. Right. I wonder if Sarika would be able to tell me who I am. Well, so. I almost did this morning. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I almost did, but I thought, oh, we'll get through this. Um, what do you think you are, Nikki? Like, as you I see myself at a lot of, as a wood person. Exactly. I do, too. Oh, you're kidding. Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, I'm – yeah. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. I see myself in other elements, too. So mm -hmm. is that pretty common? Very common. You Okay. Yeah, you know, um, and that's part of the challenge of practicing Chinese medicine is that nothing, just like with the yin-yang theory where we see a little bit of something and it's opposite, there's an attribute of all of these elements in each of us. And it's a matter of discerning, okay, what seems to be the most? Uh, and that's where we say, okay, that person tends to be predominantly that for their constitution. Um, but no, you're right. There's going to be little bits of all of it throughout. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And going back to um, just a, a water question too, because I know a lot of people are very confused on this water situation that we're in with you know, purified water, alkaline water, uh, you know, what do you think is the best kind of water to drink? The best kind of water is water that comes from deep within the earth. And um, it's interesting, Daniel Vitalis, V-I-T-A-L-I-S, mm -hmm. he has actually uh, created a map. And uh, what it is, is you can go and find in hopefully close to you a natural spring where you can get your water. That's the best water. Um, that's going to be tough for a lot of people to do. I mean, I have yeah. one maybe 30 minutes from my house, and we're always hurrying by it. And so I never stop and get any. Um, mm. But the water that I think is available to most of us, uh, if a person could get a spring water that's going to have a naturally occurring mineral content within it, uh, that is uh, the best. And obviously, preferably not um, something that's been sitting around in plastic bottles for a long time. Okay. So um, that would be um, an excellent choice. Um, I, I'm not a fan of reverse osmosis water for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, and that tends to be the water that people get a lot out of those dispensers at the store. Um, that tends to be a reverse osmosis treated water. So not the right one to be drinking all the time. You definitely want something that is going to be free of chlorine and chloramines. Um, so getting a good filter and not just on what you're drinking, but on what you're bathing in as well. Um, that's very important. And I know for our family, when we sold our, we sold a home and we moved to this home and of course, well, thankfully there were some proceeds and I said, well, we're going to take that and put that toward a whole house water filtration system that maintains the mineral content, just softens it a little bit, not a water softener, not something that you add potassium or sodium to, um, but rather a different kind of system. And I love it because for us, we can open up the tap in any room and just drink from that faucet. And so, and that, that, is called an eco-smart system. Um, so that's worked out very well for us. Um, when it comes to drinking things like alkaline water all the time, I think that's a bit much. <laughs> right, because you don't want to alkalize your, your gut. No, no, yeah. this is acidic right here in the tummy. We need yeah. it that way. And, and, and we need it that way because again, it's this whole yin-yang balance that happens, you know. 
if you continue to reduce the acidic environment of your stomach, what you're going to be doing then is you're going to be reducing your ability to break down the minerals in the foods you're eating and the protein structures in the foods that you're eating. And it's also going to dumb down that first line of defense against pathogens that come into your stomach. So spring water is, is really the best. Um, and some, something on a continuum that way that, you know, has been filtered and, but still has the mineral content within it. So I hope that helps. I, it's not a perfect answer. I mean, we, I think it's perfect. Is it perfect? Okay. That's good enough then. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. And I think that this class was amazing. It really brought, um, a lot of things together for me. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, and, and it really does compare a lot to an Ayurvedic way of, of seeing people, right? They're, they're very similar. They're, well, they have a, a same root, and Ayurvedic medicine is super, super old. And I feel like the Chinese medicine paradigm on it was almost a refinement of that a little oh, bit. Yeah. And Ayurvedic medicine is really, in many respects, very much about um, nourishing and supporting. Um, whereas Chinese medicine, a lot of the herbal therapy of Chinese medicine is, is more about clearing. And so I like bringing them both together in terms of practice because we need both, just as we talked about in the class. I mean, we need clearing. We can't be all wet because if we are, we get real flimmy and yucky, but we can't be all dry or else we'll be... Right dry so we need to nourish and we also need to clear got it yeah. yes very that's very good i love that i'll yeah. just i'll let anybody else talk and yeah, it, it, <laughs> if somebody else has a question <laughs> i'll be quiet now <laughs> and you know nikki I, I guess there's like a raise hand function and if there is and anyone has a question they can raise a hand and i'll try and you know answer that and I'm not seeing anything that way from the participants. So, um, but I'm glad you're here. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for coming. Um, so thank anything. Thank you. Else? Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. Um, and um, like I said at the beginning, you know, if you have questions, you can shoot me an email because this is a lot to take in. Um, but at the same time, it's also very simple. And we have, we'll, we'll have this uh, available for people to replay because, mm -hmm really the concept is very in depth. And so I really encourage people to listen to this again and again, to understand it. Cause you gave so much information that it's gonna, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And, and so to really have that, um, be absorbed really needs to be watched over and over again. And, uh, and to study it on their own would also be a, a wise choice too. This is just an intro to it and there's so much to learn. So thank you. You're amazing, Sarika. Love you. Thank you, sweetie. And love to everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to our next class and hearing from you. Take care. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, hon. Bye. Bye.